morning, good afternoon, good evening um, from wherever you are joining us from. Um, I am Dennis Ferretti. I'm the co-chair of the Dennis and Lenora Ferretti Foundation and also the executive chairman of the Nkafu Policy Institute in Cameroon. Um, as we know, the coronavirus pandemic has fundamentally changed the world. The response by African governments has been varied, which is one of the main reasons why we are here today and having this conversation, uh, really to better understand the challenges and the opportunities for the health sector in Africa. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome today Dr. John Kengesong. Dr. Kengesong is the director of the Africa CDC, the Africa Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Um, he was appointed to this position um, being the first director of the Africa CDC back in um, 2016. Prior to this appointment, Dr. Nkengesong was the associate director for laboratory science and chief of the International Laboratory Branch at the Division of Global HIV AIDS at the Center for Global Health. And this, is at the, this was at the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, earlier in his career, Dr. Nkengeson worked with the World Health Organization. Um, he was chief of virology for the Collaborating Center of HIV and Diagnostics at the Department of Microbiology, uh, University of the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, Belgium. And he later joined the US CDC as Chief of Virology Laboratory in Abidjan. Dr. Kingerson, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for the opportunity to have this uh, conversation with you. I'm looking forward to a very interactive and productive this, uh, conversation. Now, Doc, um, back in January of this year, um, just six months ago, when the Chinese government uh, reported the first uh, 48 cases of the novel coronavirus. You made an argument that was published in Nature uh, Medicine, and you said African countries need to be on the alert and strengthen their public health surveillance and laboratory systems, coordinated by functional national public health institutions in order to better prepare to prevent, to rapidly detect, and control any eventual spread of a novel virus on the continent. This was um, about six months ago. Now, we are, uh, six months later, after you made this statement, what is your overview of the current situation? Thank you, Dennis. I hate to say that I warn you, because that doesn't help, right? I mean, you, I hate to say that I, I told you so. I mean, nobody ever wants to say that. But, uh, you've also uh, touched on my career and, 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 and training. I'm a virologist by training, and I've worked in viruses, uh, with viruses in public health for the last 31 years. And I know uh, with that experience, you could see things that will hurt you, viruses that have the potential to have legs, and you, you kind of, I would say, you sense it very early on. So I remember that um, I, 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 we're all having a restful, uh, holiday, uh, end of year holiday season, where uh, one day I started hearing stories about or news about something happening in Wuhan and the virus, and, and it was like, geez, this is not looking good. And if you recall that uh, Nature Medicine paper, there were very few cases at that time, and I mean, less than, uh, uh, I would say, 48 cases there. And it occurred to me that um, this was going to affect Africa very, very, there was no doubt, for several reasons. One is that um, uh, we, I, I look back in 2002, 2003, and I recognize that when SARS outbreak occurred in, 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 uh, during that period, uh, Africa was largely spared because uh, we had just one case in South Africa. But if you look at the connection that we had with China at that time, it was very limited and, uh, in, in terms of aircraft. I mean, air travel between Africa and China had increased about 600-fold since uh, 2003. And Ethiopia airline itself, before they, they shut down, uh, uh, flew about five to six flights every evening to, to, to China. So all of that gave me um, uh, uh, concerns. I mean, as the head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control, I was concerned. that. So that's why I wrote that. And I also wrote that to alert the continent needed to have our systems ready because we will be in a war. And it's amazing. That time there were less than 48 cases. Now we're talking about close to 10 million cases in the world and over 
uh, close to 400,000 in, in Africa. So I think that is how viruses move. But the interesting thing is that the, we are looking eastward, that our threat will come from China, but the threat came mainly from Europe. Okay, we had uh, to it migrated because of the, the volume of traffic between China and Europe and then our own traditional relationship with Europe. So we're all looking at putting our, our defense systems facing east, which means we had to arrange for um, uh, countries to uh, countries that had linkage with China. That is Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, uh, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa, Mauritius. And we pulled them very quickly to Dakar and started training them with, on, on equipping them with diagnostics to pick this virus. And if you look at those first series of countries, they were just those countries that had direct flights to with China. But our threat, as I said, finally came from, came from Europe. It just shows you how um, we're looking east, but our threat came from the north. So we had to retool very quickly and uh, uh, applying ourselves accordingly. It just shows you how interconnected the world is um, uh, that we live in. Yes, no, um, uh, totally. Now, um, can you can you walk us a little bit regarding you know the level of preparedness and your thinking across the board um, when when back from back in in um, December, January, February, um, what was going on and how? Uh, yes, you were preparing for the, the issues coming from the worst, but within the the continent itself and your interactions with member states, uh, what was um, you all, what were you all uh, really doing to be able to you know, prepare in concrete terms? Yeah, I think we, we had a, 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 a three different layers of, of preparedness. So we just didn't ring the alarm bell and we're sitting on our lorries. No, we did. The first thing we did was that on February 22nd, uh, we convened a meeting. I mean, I explained to the chairperson of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Musa Faki Mohammed, that this threat was real. And at that time, Egypt had just recorded the first case from China, the, the case, case in China, from China. So that was the 14th of February. On the 22nd of February, convened, uh, we convened a meeting and it was a Saturday. And so within one week, I convened the leadership of the African Union that this, is, that this threat is major, we have to come together. So he agreed and convened all ministers of health and we had an, an emergency meeting in Addis Ababa. Of all ministers of health, I've never seen that kind of response because everybody knew that this was going to be dangerous for, for, and a serious threat for us. At that time, we're calling it a looming threat, okay? Because it was still hovering there. We, saw, we were observing what was going on in Europe very carefully. And uh, the, 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 the United States, of course, was just was having few cases at that time. So mm -hmm. it, it looks like we've been in this for five years, but we've been this only for about five months on the continent of Africa. So the first thing was to, to go uh, to make sure that there was a policy and political awareness. So the ministers came and we did two things. We agreed on the need to have a joint continental strategy that was underpinned by cooperation, collaboration, coordination, and communication. We said if we have to do these four things because no one country will be able to uh, fight the, the battle by themselves, this, which they agreed. Second thing we did was to establish a task force, okay, a technical and African uh, uh, a task force for COVID, uh, 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 for coronavirus. At that time, we we're calling it the Nobel Coronavirus. So it was established. And the newness of that task force was that it had to include people from Africa, CDC, the UN agencies, i.e. WHO, UNICEF, and members, member states. That way, the leadership and ownership was uh, uh, devolved to, to the countries there. So that task force started working already. It is through that task force that at the technical level, we were able to put diagnostics in rapidly from two countries. And people actually say two countries, that, that is actually misleading. By the time we were trying to do this, no country in Africa had any ability to diagnose because I remember a weekend talking to our colleagues in South Africa, um, my friend, Dr. Corin, I said, John, we don't even have anything, so you can't train here. And then we turned, I turned to my colleague and friend, Amadou Sal, the director of Pasteur Institute, I said, look, you gotta do something. And we organized the training to start on a Thursday because the, 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 the tests that we ordered from Germany were shipped by DHL, and we're not sure that if we do the training in the beginning of the week, the reagents will be there. So we took a risk. Okay, invite people into Senegal and then uh, by 
and we're tracking the, the, the DHL package got to the airport, we track it and then got it into the first day institute. So it's that kind of a risk that you take when you have an emergency to, to, to react to. So those are the different levels of preparedness that we had. We also prepared airports and airlines through what we call enhanced airport screening and surveillance. Then we also brought uh, member states, 39 of them, to Nigeria and prepared them for infection prevention control. We knew that it was going to be a, a lot of miscommunication. We brought uh, another 35 countries to uh, Tunisia and then trained them on risk communication. So that's how within four weeks we were running around like hell because we knew that the threat was going to be uh, significant. Talking about the, the testing capacity of the continent, you know, for diagnostics regarding the, the COVID-19, um, what is your assessment now? What progress have we made um, regarding diagnostics in general across the, the continent? You have a, a very broad mandate for the entire 1.3 or so billion you know, Africans. Um, where are we? What is your grading regarding, regarding testing cap uh, capability? So our testing uh, 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 capability is always, is, has always been there. Okay, I mean, we, uh, I can say this without fear of being contradicted, that Africa is the continent that uh, tests more infectious diseases than anybody else, because we do it thousands, millions of HIV tests, uh, millions of TB tests, millions of malaria tests, et cetera, et cetera. But what we didn't have in January was uh, the, the, the reagents for COVID. I mean, that is, the virus was identified, the sequences were known, uh, whereas uh, countries in Asia, Europe, and other elsewhere were developing their, their PCR-based test, that is polymerase chain reaction test, we were not doing that. We didn't do that, just because we lacked that ability to, 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 to uh, uh, create the diagnostics. Not, so I think that when we talk of capacity, we should always uh, remember that, uh, I mean, that uh, there's a difference. Now, that has become, uh, uh, that became very clearly a rate limiting step. Okay, for what we have been preaching over the years, that I mean, with diagnostics uh, in, in infectious disease, public health is your radar. Okay, it's like flying a plane with a, 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 without a, a, a radar. So it, it happened, it, it hit us. And we were, we lagged behind so much and continue to lag behind today. Today, as a continent, we've tested, uh, conducted about 4 million tests. Okay, uh, uh, on a population of 1.3 billion people. Where should we have been to be happy? I want to see 13 million tests conducted a month on the continent, okay, in order to be ahead of our pandemic. Uh, we say that we have about 400,000 people infected, but I would argue that that is an underestimate because I think there's a lot on that we, we are not seeing. And what we are not seeing may end up uh, uh, hurting us seriously because our testing levels are low, they are increasing. But uh, I mean, when we launched the partnership to uh, accelerate COVID testing about six, uh, eight weeks ago, just 450,000 tests had been conducted on the continent. So we said we need to be bold and aggressive. And we set a target of 10 million. Now we are at um, 10 million in three months. So uh, uh, six weeks later, we are at around 4 million. We have been buying tests ourselves, supplying, distributing like hell. I mean, and some of the donations that have come from uh, the Jack Ma Foundation as well. So I think um, uh, the, the rates are increasing, but uh, we are nowhere near where we should be as a continent of 0.3 billion. So that is lesson number one. When the, uh, the history of COVID will be uh, written, I mean, the number one lesson should be that Africa should uh, 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 line on externalities for its diagnostics for infectious diseases and, and create our own local manufacturing uh, the capabilities that will create jobs and transfer technology on the continent. And then I'm also that in future, we develop our own diagnostics and, and then you can scale it up internally across the continent as Singapore, Thailand and others did. The response uh, from member states, member states have had a very varied response to, you know, uh, to mitigate the spread. Um, some have uh, um, undertaken uh, full lockdown, some have been partial lockdowns, um, everybody is doing, uh, is recommending phys physical uh, distancing or so. Um, and this varied response from, from member states, how, what is your overview of, you know, the countries that have done well and the countries that have struggled? Um, and, and what lessons are you drawing from, from, from these varied responses? And what is your advice to, to um, um, uh, health ministers? 
Dennis, it's still very early to begin to uh, classify countries as those that have been successful. Uh, uh, I think Mauritius, for example, has done well. I mean, but that is, I mean, we, we had a delayed pandemic, okay, hitting the continent. I think uh, people, the media has, has tried to play that, like uh, we have the continent of Africa has been uh, spared by this pandemic. It's not right. It's a delayed pandemic. Uh, a delayed pandemic because of exactly the things that we did. When we came out of the, the emergency meeting in, in, um, in uh, Addis Ababa uh, and countries went home, we had created that, uh, uh, that common cooperation and understanding. So when the cases started arriving, uh, countries took very severe measures. If you recall, some countries declared state of emergency, they declared curfews, where cases were still about two, three, four, five, five, okay? So that helped to delay that. Now, we did our own analysis, and if a country like South Africa didn't put uh, the, uh, the lockdown the time they did, we were having uh, a, the rate, a daily rate of growth of about more than 50%. Okay, with the lockdown after 14 days, it had decreased to uh, and a daily uh, rate of about 5% new cases there. So that is significant. So it means that the, what, you are, the, the, what you are seeing now in South Africa would have occurred a long time ago. And that is true for many other countries in, on the continent. So I think that is what um, actually created the, the delay. In this. I mean, I emphasize the word delay because we are now seeing that uh, the numbers are, are, are skyrocketing. We are seeing uh, uh, weekly increases of about 20 to 25%. So we, we, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, 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 countries reacted appropriately, but we should always remember that um, our health systems, which include surveillance, laboratory network, workforce development uh, are weak. They were weak before COVID-19 and you do not strengthen health systems and, need, and use them at the same time. Okay, it's like uh, uh, needing, uh, uh, being testy and trying to dig a well. I mean, you don't dig a well when you are testy. You dig a well when you are, sick, we are, you are not testy so that the day you are testy, you go get water and drink. So that's the struggle we have now. How do you strengthen a health system in the middle of a war? I mean like this so you just have to scramble so that's what we we are doing yes and part of the scrambling that you're talking about has been uh, um, lots of training of, of of folks to do the surveillance and 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 contact tracing so how how um uh, what has been some of the challenges with with, with doing that because i know you've sent uh, uh, you've deployed uh, 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 surveillance and technicians and um, epidemiologists to various countries um, yes. As part of your, your, your support to member states. So let me just give you an example of what um, at, at some of our needs and gaps are. When you talk of a weak uh, health system, you mean surveillance systems are, are limited. And, but let's focus on uh, 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 epidemiologists. If, uh, the, the, if you follow the discussion on global health uh, security, it says for every 600,000, uh, uh, six, uh, for every 200,000 people, you need one epidemiologist, right? So if you take that number and you divide it by a, a population on a continent of 1.3 billion, it means we have, we need uh, today, we should have had 6,000 epidemiologists. But guess what? We currently have 1,400 epidemiologists on the entire continent of 1.2 to 1.3 billion. So that is a gap right there. So you don't train uh, an experienced functional epidemiologist in, in six months to fight a, a, a deadly virus like that. So we are really, we, that is the gap. One, just an example of the gap um, I'm, I'm telling. And we have known this. I call this the known do nothing gaps. Okay, we, we've known that we just don't have enough. Uh, but what we keep doing is we keep training in smaller amounts. You hear that maybe country X has a cohort of 10 epidemiologists that they are training and they would uh, uh, train them for uh, two years. I mean, you don't do that. I mean, you, I mean, this has taught us that we are at war with viruses. So we need to also react as if we are going to really war, like a, a, a shooting war. I mean, you don't go to a, a, a gunfight with a knife. I think yeah, that is what we, we are trying to do. So no, we Africa CDC have been using all kinds of creative means to, um, to support countries. Like one thing I would like to highlight, which is extremely important for this conversation is with that we reach out to the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. They authorized us to work with member states. We reach out to, they gave us three countries that committed to the Peace and Security Council agreements. Cameroon was one of that. So the government of Cameroon said, okay, good. We give you a C-130 uh, military plane. So we took that. 
went to DRC, picked up uh, uh, 28 uh, uh, epi experienced epidemiologists that were fighting, uh, they're working for Africa CDC, but fighting the Ebola outbreak in uh, Eastern uh, Congo, put them into the C-130 plane, took them to Burkina Faso, Niger, and, um, and, 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 and Mali, to, and, and some in Cameroon itself. And then we had to create a whole air corridor to allow that military plane to, to fly across multiple countries from DR Congo to those countries. Uh, that is an example of Africa, helping Africa and showing and using innovative ways to, to respond to that. Because that you need these epidemiologists. That alone is not enough. We need contact tracers. Okay, I mean, these are basic people in the community. If you test, you have to trace. This is not testing for malaria or HIV, where you can test and people come two weeks later and get their results. You have, people have to understand the importance of testing. That is, uh, that this virus spreads like a web, not like a linear thing. So you have to test people, find their, their trace their contacts, isolate them or quarantine them, um, those who are, are in need of them. Um, so we, that is what we are calling for 1 million community uh, uh, healthcare workers or basic community health workers to be deployed to support the, the testing uh, strategy. But those are all gaps. We don't have them. We didn't have 1 million people on standby. So that if you take 1 million and divide by 55 countries, you see that at least each country would need to deploy about 25,000 of those in order to catch, catch up with their epidemic. But the warning here to the ministers is, and the governments is that if you don't do what we are saying now, there will come a time that you will not contact tracing will be uh, uh, meaningless because you'll be over overwhelmed and you can't do it. As we speak, more than uh, uh, about 42 countries still have on the continent have less than 5,000 cases. Okay, so that it means you still have a chance to, to deploy the contact tracing and the testing and tracking and to beat the, the virus. But down the road, it will become very, very overwhelming. So that is my appeal to all governments. Yes, thank you very much for that. You did mention um, the, the, the Ebola, you know, the folks are fighting Ebola um, in the DRC um, uh, currently. And uh, one thing is um, the, the African Union in creating the, um, and member states in creating the, the Africa CDC is um, also an offshoot of, of um, the, so one of the lessons from the response to the Ebola virus. Um, now, how how do we um, in our in our uh, in in, tar in targeting this pandemic? How do we ensure that um, all the other um, communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases that the continent already you know was faced with are not sidelined um, as we respond to to COVID? So that's a very good question, uh, Dennis. When we conceived the the, con the joint continental strategy, we were very deliberate. We said to ourselves that we should uh, the, the the strategy should be underpinned by three things: one is to limit transmission, second is to limit deaths, and thirdly to limit harm. And harm there included social harm as well as uh, harm to other diseases. But let's remember that uh, a combination of malaria, HIV, and TB kills about 1.2 million Africans a year. So I think that is very important. I only mean, that is harm that is happening as we speak because uh, we are not able to roll out our HIV, TB, malaria programs as, as in the, before. So we are really, uh, we work closely. We are in an alignment with the UNAIDS to amplify that message that we should, yes, it's important to focus on the uh, COVID-19 because it's a very fast moving virus. Let nobody uh, be distracted with that, uh, how deadly this enemy is. It's um, an extremely deadly enemy. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there are other very silent enemies out there that are being um, that are taking over as we focus elsewhere. For example, uh, just to make sure people understand how deadly this virus is, uh, it took the world 40 years for HIV to infect 75 million people. 40 years. It has taken us five months to six months for 10 million people to be infected okay, with this deadly virus. And if you continue, the death rate continues the way it is, and the number, then we will be very close to what, uh, at a, in two years, we'll be very close to what uh, we, we experienced with the, 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 the Spanish flu in 19, 1918. So I just want that to be very clear that people don't uh, 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 undermine uh, or underestimate this enemy. We have seen that way you have underestimated this enemy, you have been ravaged by this enemy. So I think that is very, very important. 
However, we have to also make sure that the TB, the HIV, malaria, and the immunization programs are, are, are protected. And then money is not moved from these programs and to, to COVID. But that when you talk of money to support COVID is new monies that we are injecting into the system to fight uh, the fight. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, I would uh, ask you know, um, participants to pose their questions and we'll take a few for uh, Dr. Kengerson. But uh, Dr. Kengerson, one of the one of the, the 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 issues as part of our 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 health systems being you know fragile, it's also the issue of you know the, the fragility issue also has to do with um, a lot about conflict and the conflict resulting in uh, lots of folks who become internally displaced, a lot of women, um, a lot of refugees. What what is your specific recommendation to uh, member states regarding dealing with this very specific group of, of, of um, uh, specific group that are at increased risk of transmission, especially as a lot of the physical distancing measures or so are really not applicable in lots of these settings. No, you're right. We uh, have in our strategy a whole um, approach to what we call vulnerable populations and high risk populations. And that's why you heard me talk about uh, the Peace and Security Council <laughs> of the African Union and where we have uh, developed a clear strategy on how to engage with the militaries that are deployed all over the continent. We also uh, uh, have developed uh, 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 approaches and guidelines to, uh, to countries that are, we call it fragile states and there are quite a, 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 a good number of them. This is what makes it very, very deadly. We know that uh, the interaction between uh, conflicts and, and disease, uh, the spread of disease is very tight. I mean, and they, so there's no surprise that uh, the, the Spanish flu of 1980 happened after the, the, the First World War, right? So that was just immediately after the First World War and it, it was difficult to control because we're just emerging. The world was emerging from uh, a very fragile uh, systems that have been uh, uh, shattered by, by war. So, I mean, what you just stated there is a really, um, is, is a very dangerous combination. And uh, we all know that COVID uh, infection anywhere is COVID infection everywhere. So there is no uh, way that you can say that uh, you, um, you have to wait. Uh, we can ignore those, in quote unquote, fragile countries and just focus on the countries that I mean. I've always stated that as a continent, the battles will be fought locally, but the victory has to be continental. Because, I mean, COVID infection in Kenya will be COVID infection in Tanzania or in Cameroon because, I mean, of the the great interconnectivities. Yes, thank you very much um, for that, um, Dr. Kengerson. Um, we are going to take a few questions now. Um, we, we have uh, Mr. We have Enu Bless. Um, Enu Bless, can you give? Uh, what's your question for Dr. Kengerson? Okay, uh, thank you very very much. I'm happy to be with you. I've learned so much from from the doctor, especially from the high ranking. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a biotechnology student and uh, the discussion is really, is really beneficial for me. So I just wanted to ask a uh, doctor, he made a statement, um, Africa is not uh, ready to develop diagnostic kits. So I just uh, wish to uh, ask him to please um, elaborate on the statement if it is with respect to funding or if it is respect to um, the skills of uh, African researchers or academics. And also, I also wanted, and the second question, um, with respect to, we know Africa is a continent that has been dealing with epidemics, diseases, and, on, and all the like. I think probably the African CDC has a plan, and a plan to, to nurture the innovative capacity of African young researchers like us. So in that respect, what, what, what plans does the CDC have in order to, free Africa or give, develop a, an independent Africa? And how long does it think that could possibly take? Thank you for that, uh, those two, uh, the, the two great questions. I think Africa has the talents to develop diagnostic kits. I think we have to, to promote um, that as much as possible, but it hasn't happened because I don't think the field has been incentivized, incentivized enough because uh, they are over dependence on the big companies like the Abos, the Aroshis and, and others. I think this has taught us a lesson that we need to encourage innovation. We need to promote it and we need to incentivize it so that we can develop our own local indigenous uh, diagnostics because it's not a question of if we will be 
affected. It's a question of when we will be um, uh, affected. So I think um, COVID is, is an eye opener that we need to um, learn, learn from. So there is, um, there, there, there is that, and it's not difficult to develop diagnostics. That is, let's be very, very clear. When as a virologist, when I was in graduate school, most of my tests were developed in-house and used in-house, including when I served in Atlanta, we developed, we developed our, they, when we look at the market, we say, well, there is no incident test for HIV, we we'll develop it at, and then use it for a, a, a P program. So it's just the continent needs to get organized that a continent of 1.3 billion people cannot uh, rely on. But I'm happy it's emerging anyway. Uh, there's a group in, in um, Morocco, a group in Senegal, Kenya, and South Africa that are developing this, uh, begin to develop diagnostics now for, um, for COVID. In terms of uh, preparing uh, the, the country, yes, we have developed um, a five-year strategic plan since 2017, which we are, are implementing and we're implementing. And then um, COVID came in. And in one area there is that we have a framework for workforce development, okay, for the young people. We also have a, 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 on the need a workforce development a, a, a pillar. We also have a, a activity, a, a program that we just launched uh, called the Kofi Annan Global Health Leadership Program. That is aimed at, 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 at inviting emerging leaders to come spend time at the African Union. The African Union, uh, Addis Ababa, is the New York of Africa. It is the Geneva of Africa. So I sit here every day with 55 ambassadors, with um, uh, more than 200 uh, embassies across the world. They all come to the AU. The, the, the UN Economic Commission for Africa is across the, the, the street. And we want to rotate these uh, emerging leaders like you to arm them with diplomacy skills and arm them with the skills of negotiation because the 21st century is all will be based on this. This will always arise, and you see what the COVID is creating is is created people countries to fall back inward rather than outward, and you require skill sets that that are more than just knowing your epidemiology or being a good clinician to to tackle this. I think. And we also like to return them to the African Development Bank so that they understand how financing for health is discussed and how it is done. So that program, watch out for that program. It will be a prestigious program that uh, we look forward to uh, launch. Uh, we've launched it, but we look forward to recruiting the first cohort around uh, 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 September or so. So watch out for a lot of exciting things coming. We believe that the continent needs a new public health order that will ensure that we, we, we are, we, we are leaders in vaccine development. We are leaders in, in uh, clinical trials. We are leaders in diagnostic development. That is key uh, for us to, uh, to uh, uh, minimize our dependency uh, on uh, the external externalities. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that. Now I'll ask, um, we have one more question for Mr. Wilfred Ngoa. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kengesong, it's a great pleasure for me to be on this platform talking to you. I am Wilfred Ngoa. I am an epidemiologist by profession. My question goes thus. Earlier in the pandemic, uh, the WHO recommended that RDTs for COVID should be used for research and not for medical decisions. But recently, uh, the African CDC published a protocol for the use of RDTs in the diagnostics. What has changed so far? Is this a scientific decision or it's a decision based on based on need, taking into consideration that uh, so far just 0.3% uh, of the African uh, population has been tested. That's taking 4 million on about 1.3 billion. Look at the guidelines uh, 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 we that we publish is uh, we, we are not saying go out and use a ser a serology or rapid test for, to, for, for diagnostics uh, generally. We are very specific with that. and. And that is the importance of uh, the, the guidance we have, with respect to uh, when you can use it or, and how you can you can use it. So I think it's not yet. I mean, I cannot. Um, I just wanted to be clear that we are not saying that is an alternative uh, from the PCR testing. That is just. I mean, so uh, the countries are using uh, the, uh, serology. I mean, as much as they can. Uh, so put it this way, Dennis, you are a clinician. So if you you see a patient sit in front of you and it has some symptoms or some of the major symptoms for, for COVID infection and you have a rapid test and you test that person and you don't have a PCR test, you are somewhere in the remote areas of Cameroon and you don't have a PCR test and you do a serology and that serology is positive 
for that patient with all the symptoms. Would you uh, say that that patient, you, you wouldn't pay? No, you cannot. I mean, you, that is a context in which we are telling people that. But if you, you, we are not saying you go out there and do this on asymptomatic people and, what, uh, and like you do it for PCR testing there. So I think we are very careful in what we do. But we needed to show a direction for the continent that was in desperate need on how uh, to use serology. And regardless of our guidance, countries were using it for their own um, uh, needs because they were completely constrained. And the guidelines, maybe I'll just end, will continue to uh, improve as we learn more about this virus. Remember, Wilfred, that we've lived with virus on our continent only for about close to six months or even less. So we are still learning a little bit more about the virus. And uh, I mean, just the other day, I was reading a nature paper uh, published from uh, by a Chinese colleague that shows that antibodies within uh, the, that people uh, would begin to lose the antibodies very quickly within three months. I think that is a significant finding. So we are learning a lot about this virus as we move forward. And um, I'll, uh, a few questions that have been posed here. One from Rachel Edo says, um, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. John. Um, I think the challenges for Africa now are to get an accurate and to get uh, to get accurate information across local communities because social media has spread a lot of confusion. People don't know who to trust and who can give them the truth. COVID is dangerous, so we have to stand together to fight this disease. Can you give an update or information about the effectiveness of local treatment? Thank you. Of local treatment? Yes, but I think more of, of, of the, the, the spread, maybe the confusion or so that's been... Um, yeah, you, uh, as, as with any uh, major disease, uh, you expect a, a new disease, you expect a lot of confusion, you expect a lot of fear, you expect that, uh, that the community will be uh, looking for, uh, 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 desperately looking for any source of information because, I mean, of the fear factor. When fear strikes, we all uh, react very differently. And we saw this in 40 years ago in HIV AIDS. I mean, I started my career as a young virologist working around HIV AIDS in 1988. And uh, we all, everything we are seeing today, we've seen it, okay? It was all, uh, I remember in my native Cameroon, they would say that it's slow poison. There was nothing like a, that virus is a slow poison and people would uh, uh, believe that you, you have been uh, witch, uh, bewitched by that. And you, so every, all kinds of scenarios you can imagine. Uh, by the way, Rachel uh, is, um, was one of the founding uh, pioneers of the Africa CDC. So Rachel, uh, 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 you'll be proud today that Africa CDC is uh, responding to, uh, uh, representing the continent well and fulfilling the vision and, and the wisdom of the head of states in creating this public health agency um, uh, 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 in 19, and launching it in, in 2017. So uh, we are working with um, a risk communication team uh, to reach out to, the, 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 uh, to send out accurate messages. And we are working with uh, behavioral scientists, which is very important uh, to reach out because this disease, the battle will be won in the community. If we build a trust with the community, if we build the, uh, the leadership in the community and if we build ownership with the community. That's what is going to be, and it requires that we arm them with good information and we fight counter information uh, in the community collectively. So I think it's a collective responsibility and accountability for all of us. No, no one group of people, government or public health experts will win this, but we have to we'll defeat this uh, collectively. Now, now uh, Dr. Nkenge Song, um, let's talk a little bit about drug and vaccine development against COVID. Um, your team recently, um, just last week, I think, um, organized a very high level meeting on African lead Africa's leadership role um, for the development and access to a potential COVID-19 vaccine. And um, as we know, developing an effective vaccine now is um, almost the holy grail of, of COVID-19. Um, in your remarks there, you mentioned two things. One, you said um, in order, the, the two strategies that you will be pursuing regarding this um, uh, include one, securing sufficient vaccine supplies, and secondly, removing ba barriers to um, vaccine rollout. Um, can you explain a little bit regarding you know, this strategy and the, the, the way you all are looking to deploy that? So thank you, uh, um, Dennis. Uh, last week was, uh, we had a very successful uh, 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 COVID vaccine around the leadership role that the continent should play. 
and uh, the, that meeting was um, uh, attended and presided over by President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, the President of South Africa, uh, the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, and a whole series of ministers. And they, I would say all the best, uh, the, the major players in, in COVID vaccine development across the world and in Africa. I think um, we were very clear that we needed, uh, that it, it wasn't just a meeting to share information, but it was a meeting about our future continent. It was also a meeting about our development. Okay, we will not uh, win the fight against COVID-19 if we don't have a good vaccine. I mean, period. And Africa has to be at the center of that and play a leadership role. We recognize all the good words that have been said out there that a vaccine should be a, a, a common good. Uh, we recognize that countries in Europe uh, uh, China, they are saying all the right things. The right things meaning we'll, if we have a vaccine, we'll make sure that uh, developing countries are, but we cannot and will not sit and wait for these uh, conversations or these pronouncements to just be a pronouncement there. So uh, we will be judged not by how much we, uh, we tried or how much we listened to pronouncements from outside of the continent. We will be judged by uh, the future generation, by what did we do to bring vaccines uh, and make them accessible to uh, the, our people on the continent in order to secure that future that I just described and in order to secure that development there, period. There is no doubt in my mind how the history will, 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 write, will be written about us who are here today uh, at the front line fighting this virus. So there are a couple of things we have to look at. First, the research and development, we cannot uh, uh, just be on the sidelines and not take part in active vaccine research. And that active vaccine research means many things, okay? Even preparing the population for, for, for uh, uh, the right population, they're characterizing their own viruses so that we know exactly how the, the viruses are behaving in Africa, et cetera, et cetera, is important. We cannot, as a continent, as of today, there's one clinical trial that just started in South Africa. But this is not acceptable for a continent of 1.3 billion people. And we should be doing more clinical trials. The way you engage the community is to start with phase one trials, phase two, phase three, so that you build a rapport and a relationship with the community. Otherwise, the anti-vaccine movement will take over. Okay, even and when you have a good vaccine. We have to look at networks that will do that for us. We have to look at issues related to uh, 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 transfer of uh, IP intellectual properties to uh, groups in Africa. As we speak, the Institute Pasteur in Senegal produces that yellow fever vaccines. We also know that there's a group in, uh, in Egypt that produced, uh, and I think South Africa and others. There. So if they have intellectual property transfer agreements, as per the Doha agreement and, uh, and others, then uh, these companies can, have, uh, can help with the scaling up of vaccines once they, they are produced there. And lastly, we have to learn from history. In 1996, the first uh, a series of uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy called HAG was produced. And I remember I was a, a young researcher at that time where we were attending a meeting in Vancouver, the AIDS conference. 1996, those drugs were beginning to be available to patient, HIV infected patients in the West, but it would take us to 2002 to 2003 as a continent to begin to get access to, uh, to HIV potent uh, drugs. I was a young researcher uh, working for the US CDC in Cote d'Ivoire at that time. So that was a delay of close to seven years. You cannot imagine that if there's an effective vaccine, the continent will be delayed by even two years. I mean, we'll be gone. So I think that is why it's so important for Africa uh, to come together and take a position and we will be developing and finalizing a framework and a strategy a strategic uh, 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 plan for access to vaccines on the continent and presenting it to the head of states in the coming days, not weeks. As a clinician, there are a, a couple of things. One um, that, that really uh, concerns us is the issue of um, PPEs, personal protective equipment, um, and, and, uh, and uh, healthcare worker exposure and, and um, you know, the challenges that we've had uh, regarding that. Um, with, with the closure of borders, we um, uh, uh, we, we saw a, a really rapid um, increase in production of ma face masks um, from within, within countries. And you know, how are we, or what is this, where are we currently regarding PPEs um, for various member states? Um, uh, there, there, there have been issues with 
um, read recently how Ethiopian Airlines um, has been has been uh, very critical in movement of PPEs around the world and and uh, uh, you know transitioning from uh, uh, East Asia, China to um, Africa and Latin America because of the fact that the world is tough and and some West Western countries um, get to seize PPEs um, from, from poorer countries uh, and, and things like that. And that has been reported. And I know you wrote uh, recently in the Lancet paper regarding the fact that Africa is not even allowed on the table to, to purchase uh, 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 certain reagents for certain tests. Um, how are we, where are we currently with the whole issue of PPD, uh, PPEs and protection of, of clinicians on the front line or health, health workers on the front line? So, yeah, I mean, that, uh, thank you, Dennis. That was uh, uh, a worldview that I wrote um, in Nature uh, where uh, we were really uh, struggling. So it was really a call, an appeal for global, uh, uh, greater solidarity and an appeal for planning that we have to uh, uh, fight these battles locally in, in, in individual countries. And of course, I respect the fact that it is ultimately the, the responsibility of the, to ensure the health security of a citizen. But to know that this was a global uh, a crisis that required a global solution. Now, uh, th that was then. Uh, if you have uh, followed our uh, uh, the progress, I mean, uh, uh, under the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa, in his capacity as the chair of the African Union, you must have noticed that uh, we now have a platform uh, called the, the, the African Medical uh, 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 Supply Platform that was developed uh, in partnership with uh, uh, Mr. Stripe Masiwa, who is the, the CEO of Econet and uh, based out of the UK, who was mandated by President Cyril Ramaphosa to, to help in that. So if you go online and research that, and you can you, you actually realize you'll be amazed that you can go in there and you shop like you're shopping in Alibaba.com or um, Amazon.com. Okay, so you I mean and quarters. Each country has the quarter. Like Cameroon has a quarter there. It's not free of charge. It's um, again that comment I made about even if you have money, you don't know where to buy. Now you know where to buy. You can go in there and and and, and do the procurement. Another thing that you should uh, know is that uh, uh, through the AU, uh, the chairperson, uh, President Amaposa, is he named uh, special invoices like the, the Dona Kaburuka, the, the Ngozis, and, and others who are out there negotiating with multilateral and bilateral. It's all part of the coordinated uh, strategy that we have for the continent. So they've been negotiated billions of dollars in debt relief uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Vera Songwe, the, uh, the uh, executive secretary of the UN um, uh, um, Economic Commission for Africa. So the mon they are, uh, there's money from the debt relief, the debt standpoint that countries can use to now procure, uh, go to this uh, platform and buy their PPEs and buy their uh, reagents. And the African Exim Bank has also joined in there to serve like an underwriter for, for countries. So country X wants to buy and they are struggling to transform. They can actually take that and then uh, facilitate that purchase from, from wherever. They, I mean, and they are all uh, commodities from everywhere, including Africa, local manufacturers in Africa, are all, all on that platform. So we have revolutionized that, transformed that. It's up to countries now to use it. And we did, uh, uh, the African Union uh, brought the, all ministers of finances together and ministers of health at, and exposed the platform to them. And in other words, we're telling, of the finance that look, you guys, you have the money. That is uh, the, the, the Ngozis and others have generated from the, the, this negotiation. You have to uh, uh, support the Minister of Finance to, to buy the, uh, use the platform. So that has changed. I mean, that way, you, at least you have access, you, you know where to go get stuff. Uh, it's a question of countries now going there and doing it so that they can um, use some of the monies that they are getting from this. Uh, the multilateral and bilateral negotiations to, to support your COVID response. Thank you. Now we are, wrap, we are about to wrap up. I'll take one quick question from Odette um, Kibu, which is, uh, we all know digital health is critical and important in this era of, of COVID-19 pandemic. How can member states take advantage of digital health to fight this pandemic? Um, uh, Doc, uh, quick response. No, sure. I mean, the, that is... Uh, uh, with uh, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Vera Sungwe, 
the, the executive secretary of UN uh, Commission of Africa and, and other colleagues and, and head of states, we did launch a, a, a digital platform that we recognize that this is going to be uh, the future. I mean, we've uh, been hiding behind doors for the past uh, six months now, and it's thanks to digital, digital herd that we are able to, or the, the, what I call the fourth industrial revolution that came to us forcefully because of COVID, that we are able to do this. And I'm sure that uh, many things will never be the same again. Yeah, so now, um, Doug, before your, your, your concluding remarks, um, wh where, uh, what is it, you know, you can only see beyond your nose, what, what is it that is of preoccupying you the most this week and next week? So this week, what is preoccupying me is the ability for countries to, to expand their testing in country as much as possible. Because as I said, I'm still optimistic that we have a good chance to fight this virus and we have to fight it quickly. A, a one week in this a, 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 a pandemic uh, it looks like uh, it's it one month because of the doubling numbers. It, we are going up very, very quickly. It took us 98 days as a continent to get to 100 cases, but then it took us only uh, at, at about 18 days to get to 200,000 cases. And then it took us less than 10 days to get to 300 thousand cases. So that doubling is scary. So we need to scale that up this week. I mean, if I, want, if I had a message to the, ministry, to the governments, I would say, hey, scale that up, decentralize it, be innovative, be bold, and be aggressive in, in doing the testing. That is what will preoccupy me this week um, uh, uh, and, and next week. And uh, now, um, uh, 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 what is your, your final message um, for us and how, what, what are you learning from COVID? So we, the final message to everybody is that uh, we can only win this fight collectively. Uh, this is something that we cannot uh, leave it in the hands of government alone or gov uh, the hands of uh, uh, public health experts. We have to be a collective, uh, uh, strong, which means uh, discipline. Uh, we have to maintain the basic uh, 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 public health measures, I mean, that is washing of hands, uh, distancing as much as possible in our own context. And, 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 and knowing that the solutions have to come, must come from, 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 from within the community, as I, I, I indicated. I think that is uh, very, very um, important. That is, we, we remain hopeful and that we, uh, we must win this fight to survive as a continent. Um, it's a daily virus. And anyone that has underestimated the enemy has paid a big price for I mean, anywhere in any country. Doc, um, it's been extremely, extremely delightful for us to have you, and I thank you for, for spending your hour with us. I know how busy your schedule is. Um, my regards to, to all. Please stay safe, and thank you very much. Um, I, want to, I want to thank everyone who has joined us. Um, this has been a very wonderful conversation. Um, I will continue to have these conversations um, on, on, on a biweekly basis with um, leading Africans um, uh, across the continent as to how we respond to, to COVID and the lessons we draw from them. So thank you very much and Doc, stay safe and we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity and be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you all.